I'm Rob St. Mary here with the Detroit Free Press Motor City Comic Con 2019 edition. 30th anniversary, hard to believe. 30 years, wow. I think I went to the first one. How did that happen? Anyway, so here for the next panel. The next panel is with the great Mr. George Takei. That's right. Helmsman Sulu from Star Trek. Um, you know him from there, but you know he's done other things. You know, he's done a lot of different work, and I, I think what's what's kind of interesting about um, Takei is that he really had a rebirth, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago, by being on a radio show, which les, lends its name to the name of this panel, which was he was on the Howard Stern Show and led to that famous saying of his, oh my, that's right, so it's the oh my panel with George Takei here at Motor City Comic Con. He's gonna talk for mm, about an hour. Uh, a lot of fans here, packed house, of course. Anyone in, involved with Star Trek, and especially at his level, fans wanna come out, wanna meet him. So it's gonna be a great conversation. I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. You're gonna enjoy it. And of course, you can enjoy all of the various videos and all the interviews and all the behind the scenes and the cosplay and everything else that the Free Press is bringing to you this weekend at Motor City Comic Con 30th edition on our website, freep.com. Of course, all of the Detroit Free Press social media channels such as Facebook and Instagram and Twitter as well. So it'll all be there for you to enjoy if you can't get to it now, you can always come back and check it out later. So uh, it's a lot of fun here at Motor City Comic Con. It's Saturday. We'll be here tomorrow as well. Um, more more interviews, more panels, more behind the scenes for you to really get a get a flavor of what all this is about. And, um, you know, to kind of give you an idea of what it's all about, I was talking to some folks earlier who came in and they said it took them a half hour to get through the line. So... This kind of shows a lot of folks here today. Uh, it's actually the floor space is a little bigger. They've reconfigured it a little bit. Um, if you've been here in previous years, you kind of remember that all the celebrities are on one side and they've got the artists on the other. Well, they like took out a wall and there's even more going on down there. So there's more vendors, there's more artists, there's more people here to sign autographs and, and take photos and all of that. There's more panels. So it's, it's a lot more for this 30th anniversary. So as I said, we're waiting in just a few minutes. Mr. George Takei, Sulu from Star Trek, going to uh, talk to the audience here at Motor City Comic Con 30th edition. I'm Rob St. Mary here for the Detroit Free Press. And uh, once again, we thank you for uh, tuning in, taking a look, and, and getting an up-close look at what's on with uh, George Takei and his uh, members of Star Trek. So. We're going to get you over there in, in just a few minutes. Did you get a chance to um, check out the photos? Great photo galleries at Freep.com of uh, the opening day yesterday on Friday. Uh, got to, you know, Friday's a little bit of kind of a half day. It's not as crazy as today is. So there were some opportunities uh, to meet with uh, some of the celebrities and cosplay folks. So you should go check that out. And uh, check out the other offerings at Freep.com and also at our social media channels on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And uh, as I was saying, George Takei here at the 30th edition of Motor City Comic Con from the Suburban Collection Showplace in Novi. Uh, if you're coming up, 96 might be a little crazy. Parking as well. So uh, just keep that in mind if you're heading to Novi for this star-studded event, as we should say. Um, some of the other people that are here, it's quite a mash, quite a quite a showcase of, of various folks. There's some folks here from uh, uh, Walking Dead and Sons of Anarchy and um, one of my personal favorites, John Cleese, if you like Monty Python, Henry Winkler, the Fonz is here, and um, some folks from the office. Maybe you saw that panel. If not, go back and check that out. I'm just, that was a good time. So, as I was saying, uh, George Takei, Helmsman Sulu from Star Trek, is supposed to start in just a few minutes. So, I'm going to head over there and leave you to it. All right? Hello, Star Trek fans. <laughs> We have lived long and prospered. Here you are, all of you. And um, I see original fans out there. You know who you are. And bravo to you, thank you very much. I can tell be because of the color of their hair. Or the lack thereof. And and certainly the ladies with their long, glowing, silvery tresses. 
they are the ones that first found us. And they were the stalwarts because uh, our ratings were very low when we were on first run, as many of you know. But then after they canceled us, we went uh, up on syndication. And the syndicators put it on five nights a week, Monday through Friday. And that's when we found the audience. And so there is the rest of you. I mean, the thing about Star Trek fans, they've grown and grown and grown over the years because you, the original fans, multiply like triples. <laughs> generation after generation after generation. And Star Trek is now 53 years old. So thank you all. This would not have happened without you. I mean, Gene Roddenberry created Star Trek, but this longevity of Star Trek was created by all of you, the fans that kept on keeping on, trekking and trekking, and insisting that we come back with our next generations and the generations after that. And now, you know, well, I don't know what generation we have on the air right now, <laughs> but they are planning another generation of Star Trek, another TV series with Patrick Stewart. <laughs> so, you know, we are so grateful to all of you because it's the fans that made this longevity. And it's the fans that gave me personally this other gift of amplifying my voice. Not this thing here, but you all amplified my voice. And I've been able, able to speak out and speak uh, up on so many issues that are very near and dear to me. And you've supported me. On that. And I have, uh, I mean, so many of you have come, uh, come up to me and thanked me for my speaking out. But it's all of us speaking out together. We're pulling at the same wagon, as I say, because the issues are those that any Star Trek fans will understand. First of all, Gene Roddenberry <coughs> created Star Trek, uh, or the Starship Enterprise, as a metaphor for Starship Earth, as I'm sure you've all heard. And the strength of the Starship, he said, was its diversity coming together and working in concert as a team. Diversity of Starship Earth coming from all different planets, all different cultures, speaking all different languages, all different colors and races and faiths coming together and working in concert. That's what gave, gave us our strength. And metaphorically, that's what we saw on Star Trek. But even more than that, it applies to the real world today. And I've been able to see, speak out on issues of our times uh, uh, because of the uh, support and the amplification of my voice that you gave me. I have lived a, an amazing life, if I must say so myself, because at five years old, I was called an enemy alien by my own country, the United States of America, simply because I happened to look like the people that bombed Pearl Harbor. And they put us all in barbed wire prison camps in our own country. There were 10 barbed wire prison camps all over the country in the most desolate places in, in, in the USA. We were sent to a camp in the swamps of Arkansas. Arkansas. When I was a five-year-old kid from Southern California, from Los Angeles, and it was to me a, an incredible adventure to be in the swamps and to, my parents told us about these snakes, water moccasins in the water that were poisonous, and so we avoided that. But I saw little tiny black wiggly fish 
that I caught with my hands and put into a, a, a jar and watched them grow bigger and then they grew legs and then a tail dropped off and the legs grew even longer and they turned into frogs. Magic! <laughs> Another morning I woke up, looked out our barracks window and it was a picture in black and white. The black tar paper barracks and everything else was covered in snow. I'd never seen that. Another magical experience. So my childhood experience behind those barbed wire uh, fences were that of an innocent child. And I have a graphic uh, me uh, memoir. I keep calling it a graphic novel. It's not a novel, it's a true story of my life. I, a graphic memoir of a child, a five-year-old kid, six years old, seven and eight, growing up behind American barbed wire fences. That book is called, They Called Us Enemy, and it's coming out on July 16th. So watch for it. Uh, it's a charming story told from a child's vantage point, but I also include my parents' vantage point and how they experienced that. They worked all their lives, saved up, had a home, had a business, and suddenly, because of that one event at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii, we were blamed for it because we looked like them. And our bank account was frozen. My father couldn't do business. We couldn't pay our mortgages. So they took our home, the bank took our home, everything. And then they put us in these prison camps in the most un-American way. Because when we're arrested in this country, we have the right to know the reason why. In our case, there were no charges and there, therefore no trial because you need ch charges to challenge. And then, you know, if you're guilty, then you're in prison. None of that. Due process is a central pillar of our uh, justice system. That completely disappears. Thank you for that. And so I, I've been able to, uh, well, I wrote my autobiography, which came out in 1994, called To the Stars, and I wrote about it, but with uh, the graphic memoir, I tell it in pictures and with a fantastically talented uh, 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 animation artist, uh, Harmony Becker. Lovely name, isn't it? Harmony Becker. And she catches every expression so wonderfully. And so that book is coming out. But just this past Monday, I, I completed a five month shoot on an amazing. Tele uh, uh, a miniseries, television miniseries, uh, titled The Terror Infamy. Uh, it's uh, an AMC uh, 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 TV ser a series, and it will, that will start on uh, August 12th. And so watch for that, because that too is about my child, not about my childhood imprisonment, but the imprisonment of 120,000 Japanese Americans in these 10 barbed wire prison camps. I'm able to tell these stories because of what you have given me. This, uh, not only amplification, but my name having some uh, business uh, cachet, business value. Uh, they would cast me in a, a story on the internment. Uh, unless I, I, I'm able to, to attract an audience, and I do attract all of you. <laughs> so you're the reason why. So I have ble been blessed in many ways to be able to tell that story, because over the course of my 82 years now of being on this planet, I've had some uh, experiences that I never thought 
I would uh, have. During the Civil Rights Movement, I did a uh, civil rights musical titled Fly Blackbird, and it was a big hit in Los Angeles. It ran for almost uh, a year, 11 months, and during the course of that run, we were invited to uh, sing at various uh, civil rights rallies. And the biggest, of the, uh, <clears throat> the biggest of the rallies was at the sports arena in, uh, in downtown LA. And the keynote speaker was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., one of the great heroes of American history. And we got to march in together with him into that vast arena that holds uh, tens of thousands of people. And he, he spoke and his, his speech, his eloquence was inspiring. And our spirits soared up to the rafters. And, after, and then we sang as well uh, um, songs from uh, Fly Blackbird. And after the rally, we were uh, uh, ushered downstairs to uh, Dr. King's dressing room. And I got a chance to meet with him, shake his hand, chat with him briefly. And I must say, for about three days after that handshake, this hand didn't get washed. <laughs> I've had so many amazing experiences because I gave my father a hard time uh, when I became a teenager. I wanted to know more about my childhood imprisonment. And so I had many, many long after dinner conversations. And because I've uh, been inspired by Dr. King, I, I talked to my father about how unjust our imprisonment was. And uh, my father tried to explain to me, and I learned about American democracy, the American justice system, from a man who suffered the most in our family. He, he went, underwent so many torturous uh, experiences during the Second World War in an American prison camp. And he was still, despite all that we went through, he was able to ex explain to me the basic ideals of American democracy. He said the ideals are great. These shining ideals of American democracy was articulated by great men, the founding fathers. They were people of great imagination and great sense of justice and ideals, but they were also fallible human beings, like all of us are. We as human beings have the potential to do great things, but we are also fallible human beings. He said George Washington was a great first president. Even before that, he led the uh, war for independence. He, he set the pattern as a president for how a president should conduct himself. He was someone who had values and a sense of what the presidency should be about. Thomas Jefferson, the third president of the United States, was a great man wrote the Declaration of Independence, all those shiny, bringing words. All men are created equal, endowed with an inalienable right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But these great men were also fallible human beings. They kept other human beings as slaves. And that was the first sin of America. And that story is repeated time and again. But I've had the privilege of working with so many people in the civil rights movement, not just with uh, Dr. King and the cast of uh, Fly Blackbird, but uh, in my old town of Los Angeles, we had a, con uh, a, a city councilor who was a great man who also shared Gene Roddenberry's vision of uh, of diversity coming together and working together. Gene Roddenberry, when he uh, uh, left the Air Force, came to Los Angeles and he was a beat policeman. And our city councilman, Tom Bradley, was a beat policeman in downtown Los Angeles. They knew each other. 
they shared that same vision. And Tom Bradley became our city councilman, but then he ran for mayor of the city of Los Angeles. And I served as the Asian American chair of Tom Bradley for mayor of Los Angeles campaign. And when he won, he appointed me to the Southern California Rapid Transit District, the uh, agency that ran public transportation in Los Angeles County. And his mandate to us was to build the first subway system in Los Angeles, because he said, LA is gonna grow, and we can't be a city that's dependent on just the automobile. We need a multimodal public transportation system and we need a subway system because we're going to become a dense city. And so we began the process of building that subway system, and we succeeded. Come to Los Angeles and ride on the newest and best subway system in all of the United States, the Southern California Metro system. And that kind of, and, and uh, Tom Bradley became the most uh, successful mayor of the city of Los Angeles. He was re-elected five times. He served 20 years as the mayor of Los Angeles. And I'm proud to have been involved in his campaign and in his administration to make LA the city that, that it's become. I have been blessed in so many, many ways, but I'm always mindful of the fact that what I'm able to do, what I'm able to speak out on, is made possible by all of you, the Star Trek fans. <laughs> and so, from the bottom of my heart, thank you very much. Now, I understand that uh, we're going to engage in the part that I enjoy the most, the uh, conversation. And I see a mic here. So do line up here and uh, begin our conversation. And we have somebody standing up, two people that are standing up. <clears throat> oh, thank you. Um, my name is Adam, and I just want to ask, I know you talk about how grateful you are for all the fans keeping Star Trek alive for so long. I just wanted to ask how it felt knowing that something you helped start in 1966 is still getting new, new shows, new material today. It's not just that we're reliving you know, glory days and we're on our old show, but that it's still alive. I was wondering how that made you feel, knowing that you helped create that. Well, um... It's the uh, writers that are writing the new shows. It's the actors that are acting in the, uh, what we call uh, our next generation stories the, and their children and their children. And uh, I, I'm very possessive and proud of all our children. We've got many <laughs> spin-off children here. And uh, they're wonderful actors that uh, give uh, flesh and blood to the stories that are being written by very talented uh, writers, producers, and directors. And so uh, it's, uh, again, just like on the Enterprise, the teamwork of a lot of people, each with their own gifts, own unique uh, talents to contribute. Infinite diversity in infinite combinations is more than just uh, uh, I aliens and, and earthlings, but our talents and our unique uh, skills that uh, work, work together to make uh, this, these moving shows possible. And so uh, my tribute is also to all of them that's keeping uh, Gene Roddenberry's vision alive today, 53 years later. And I just want to thank you. I know you thank us for amplifying your message, especially about the Japanese internment camps. Uh, Not Japanese internment camps. The they were American internment camps for American citizens yes. of Japanese ancestry here in the United States of America. I think the proper way, the press keeps referring to them as Japanese internment camps, and so I understand why people call it that. But if you really 
analyze it by grammar. Japanese internment camps were run by Japan. We were in American internment camps. The uh, best way to uh, identify them as what they were is Japanese American internment camps. But, uh, I get the little college professor out of me. Like, like <laughs> <laughs> I, I just became a lawyer, and our first day in law school, we are taught about the Korematsu decision, about the Korematsu decision, and we're taught 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 about the well, it's a two-way street. I thank you as a law student for learning about it, and I'm glad that they're teaching about it now. But as I said earlier, I couldn't talk publicly uh, like this to an audience this large, or I've spoken at universities and uh, uh, chamber of, chambers of commerce. In fact, even, I've even spoken at Cambridge and Oxford in England. The Brits are interested in where Americans stumbled. <laughs> they get a little glee out of that. <laughs> so, you know, here again, it's us working together. You mentioned the Korematsu uh, uh, ruling. Fred Korematsu was Japanese American who stood up and spoke out, and he challenged the internment of Japanese Americans all the way up to the Supreme Court. And in 1944, while the war was still raging, the Supreme Court ruled against him. The Supreme Court, the highest court of the land, ruled against him. And that's called the Korematsu ruling. And it's been on the records all these many years. But this year, the Korematsu uh, uh, ruling of 1944 was overturned by the current Supreme Court. But I wasn't celebrating that because on that very same day that they overturned Korematsu, in the same session of the Supreme Court, they upheld the third attempt by Donald Trump to ban Muslims from uh, entering into this country, the Muslim travel ban. I call it the third attempt because he, the first executive order that he uh, wrote was the Muslim travel ban. And when that uh, 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 executive order was signed, I, I was heartened because so many Americans rushed to their airports to protest the uh, uh, first Muslim travel ban. And attorneys rushed to the airports to uh, volunteer their services pro bono. So we have learned from the, the uh, internment of Japanese Americans. But, and, uh, well, I, and, and in addition, the Deputy Attorney General, Sally Yates, refused to defend that first tra travel ban. And so Donald Trump tried again with the second travel ban. And that, too, was beaten down. And the third time that he tried it, it went all the way to the Supreme Court. And in the same session that they overturned the Korematsu uh, uh, Supreme Court ruling upholding the imprisonment of innocent Japanese Americans, in that same session, they upheld Donald Trump's third Muslim travel ban. It was chilling to me. The Supreme Court of the United States today, in the year 2019, can't tell the difference between the Korematsu ruling and the, uh, the Muslim travel ban ruling. It is a frightening thing, even today. And I hear the echoes of my childhood imprisonment so much in this day and age. The humanitarian outrage happening at the southern border with Mexico. At least I, as a child, was together with my parents, my brother and sister and I. Today, people are not only being put in cages, but their children are being taken away from them. 
children, infants, are being torn away from their mothers. It is a shameful thing that's repeating itself in America today. We've got to learn the lessons of history, and I'm glad they're teaching it in law courses, but we need to teach it in high school, junior high school. And that's why I wrote uh, uh, They Called Us Enemy as a graphic novel, because it's targeted, targeting the teenage and uh, preteen audience. We need young people to know this history of America, this dark chapter of American history, so that they will know something about it. There are so many adults today that don't know what happened during, to Japanese Americans in America during the Second World War. And so we want to educate the next generation so that this story will not be forgotten. And it is in our textbooks now, which I couldn't find as a teenager. And there are TV series and movies being made on it. And so we're hopeful that the next generation of Americans will keep this sort of thing from happening ever again. Hi. <clears throat> I have a question for you. Uh, you were on an episode of The Twilight Zone called The Encounter, and I was just wondering in that role if you felt empowered by the role that you had, if you felt a special connection with that character, if you could speak about that. Yes, it was. I, I leaped at that because it, this was even before Star Trek. It was a two character drama for those of you who did, did not see it. Uh, uh, the other character was uh, played by Neville Bran, a vet <clears throat> veteran of the Pacific Theater uh, from the Second World War. And I played a young Japanese American uh, who uh, was a gardener. And it's a lazy Saturday afternoon, and he's cleaning, cleaning out his attic. And he invites me upstairs to uh, uh, have a, a can of beer with him. And our conversations start and Wong, the Twilight Zone thing happens. He goes back to his wartime days. And I imagine my father uh, in, uh, in Hawaii signaling the Japanese to bomb uh, certain locations that would hit the uh, ships. It was an, a wonderful acting opportunity for me, so I leaped at it. It was a chunk of raw, raw red meat bloody red meat, you know, <laughs> and a chance for me to really emote and chew the scenery. <laughs> I commit suicide at the end of it, so you know I got emotional. <laughs> um, I felt very fulfilled by that role, but the Japanese American community reacted in a way that I had not expected. They uh, protested that because there was no Japanese American ever that uh, worked with the uh, bombers of uh, Japan uh, bombing Pearl Harbor. There's no record of that. But this is Twilight Zone. I mean, I thought, you know, I mean, Bill Shatner ne never appeared on the wing of a flying plane. <laughs> And we knew that, you know, that was fantastical. And I, I thought this script was fantastical because there's no record of any Japanese American act, uh, in, uh, engaged in any, any traitorous activities. So I, I was absolutely dumbfounded by that reaction. But CBS, in uh, respect of the Japanese American sensibility, uh, pulled that back and that one episode wasn't aired for something like 20 years uh, after its first airing. And only when the video started coming out that it, uh, it was released as a video and people have discovered it. And I'm sure you weren't there when uh, it was first aired. I can tell by looking at people. I've aged very well. <laughs> Either that or you're very well preserved. <laughs> And go ahead. No, I was just going to say it's a brilliant performance. Just 
just a very, very dramatic, and you sell it, you totally sell that role. And, and you have to say, you, you sink your teeth into it, for sure. Well, thank you for that compliment. I'll return the compliment to you. You have excellent taste and high standards. <laughs> Parents are your parents, but you are you, and we are our own individual selves, and you're speaking up right today, so don't apologize for your parents. Uh, and also, I want to know if your parents ever got their business back. You know, the war ended, and the gates of the prison camp were thrown open. I mean, as irrational as that, you know, suddenly we were freed. I mean, the whole thing was irrational. I mean, clearly we had nothing to do with it, but they uh, labeled us as enemy aliens and imprisoned us. And when the war was over, suddenly we were American citizens again. It was crazy, but the hostility was still intense. Our first home, after we were released was on Skid Row in downtown LA. Our home was gone, business was gone, we had no money. They gave us $25 to start life over again from zero. We were impoverished, we had nothing, and they gave us each $25, the children as well as the adults, to begin life anew. And the only place that we could find housing. I mean, even if we had uh, $250 or $2,500, we couldn't find, uh, we couldn't get housing because we looked like this. And the only place where we, uh, my parents could find housing was on Skid Row. And to us kids, the most traumatic part of the internment was being freed. Because at least behind those barbed wire fence, there was regimentation, there was order, there was, you know, normality, I mean, that we adjusted to. I mean, as normal as a prison camp could, could be. You know, when I made the night runs from uh, the uh, uh, barrack to the latrine at night, searchlights followed me. To my parents, it was invasive, it was degrading, it was humiliating, but to me, I thought it was nice that they lit the way for me to pee. <laughs> I mean, you know, it was dark otherwise. <laughs> so, you know, my experience was as a child, but the hostility and the, and the scariness of uh, Skid Row, smelly, ugly, sc scary people, you know, staggering about, sprawled out on the sidewalk. There was one event when we were walking down the uh, sidewalk as a family, and this derelict came staggering toward us, glaring at us. And we all, you know, stopped. And we thought he was going to attack us. But as he approached us, he suddenly collapsed and barfed. <laughs> and my baby sister, who went in as an infant, and she was four years old then, she said, Mama, let's go back home. That's all she knew of her life, her four years of life. Barbed wire fence became our home, and freedom was so horrible. I mean, to me too. I mean, the stench of human waste everywhere, on the street, in the hallways, everywhere. And chaos, screaming, yelling, you know, um, men uh, uh, brawling with each other, women shrieking and pulling hair, and police cars shrieking day and night. And at night, our Skid Row room would glow red from the uh, police car. Uh, uh, it was horrible. I 
went to school and the teacher called, uh, kept calling me the Jap boy, which hurt, which stung. But you know, that was freedom to us. To us kids, we'd much rather be behind bar uh, barbed wires because it was normal to us. And so for my parents, it was a hard uh, uh, struggle to get back on our feet. But um, as amazing as it may sound, four years after um, uh, we were released, my parents, by scrimping and saving their hard-earned money, was able to buy a home in the uh, neighborhood that we uh, lived in before the war, the Wilshire District a three-bedroom home. And I later on found, found out how much they paid for the home that I grew up in. $10,000 for a three-bedroom home. It was amazing. Uh, and so uh, freedom was not what, uh, uh, would, uh, uh, what you would connote it to mean. It was a horror show for us. And that's what we deal with in this TV uh, miniseries called The Terror, Infamy. It was a terror in camp, but even worse, outside of, of uh, camp. Also, like um, yesterday, you were asking how people like their coffee. I didn't see my order this morning, <laughs> sitting in their area. You didn't see your what? My coffee order. Oh! <laughs> I said, I didn't know. I'm very disappointed. I'm very disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> Good afternoon. My name is Hi. And uh, I, I have followed your career since I was old enough to watch TV and have very much appreciated all of it. I also very much appreciate the, the speaking act that you've done and the things that I've learned because. And I grew up in southwest Missouri, and there was nothing in our history books. There wasn't in Los Angeles either. Uh, uh, I, you know, I became a teenager in the 1950s, and I became very curious about my childhood imprisonment. And I, I, I became a, a voracious reader. I read every book that I thought might have something about uh, the internment, all the history books and the civics books. From the civics books, I uh, learned about the ideals, the noble ideals of our democracy, but nothing about the internment, and certainly in the history books. And it w I knew then that we have to take the initiative, and we dealt with the Board of Education. We founded a museum called the Japanese American National Museum to in institutionalize that story so that it will remain further. I, uh, we developed <clears throat> A Broadway musical. I was gonna, that's what I was going to ask. Well, thank you. <laughs> you saw it. No, but you closed three weeks before I was able to see it. Oh, you told me, yeah. yeah. But you saw the uh, film version. Yes. Thank you for that. I was going to ask if it's going to tour. <laughs> uh, it did tour. Uh, we went to Boston and Los Angeles. Uh, we Before... Um, we went on Broadway. We played in San Diego as a out-of-town tryout, then Broadway, and then Los Angeles, Boston, and it played in uh, Hawaii. I wasn't in the Hawaii production, and uh, it just closed uh, while we were filming um, uh, Terror uh, in uh, Vancouver, British Columbia. Can you imagine? We, uh, we did a 10-part series on a, a chapter of American history in Canada. <laughs> but the same thing happened in Canada too. Japanese Canadians were imprisoned and interned as well. So, you know, North Americans got completely swept up by uh, war hysteria and racism and the lack of political leadership. I, I would love to play in the Detroit uh, campaign to get it done here. Uh, what? And as one final thing, thank you also for all the advocacy you've done for LGBT. 
Yeah. Absolutely, it's the same thing. The issue is the same. You know, we were characterized by this sweeping, broad brush characterization that we were a threat to national security, that we are potential spies, saboteurs, traitors, you know, without any evidence. And in, in retrospect, there was no act of sabotage or spying or any kind of traitorous activity by, activities by Japanese American. None. But it's that same mentality but with the Muslim travel ban. All people of the Muslim faith are potential terrorists. Or people coming across uh, the southern border. All people uh, coming across the southern border are rapists, drug dealers, or uh, murderers. Uh, you've heard it all from uh, that guy that's in the White House. <laughs> I mean, that, that mentality. And when I was uh, in my late 20s, I discovered gay bars. They, were, they became sanctuary where I could uh, let down all, all my guard and uh, uh, talk with uh, pe other people as me. But one of the older guys told me that even in a gay bar, I had to be uh, careful because they occasionally raided gay bars and marched everybody uh, in the gay bar out, put them on, uh, into uh, paddy wagons, drove them to uh, the police station, and photographed them, put their names on a list, and it was a terrifying thing to, for gay people we, because we were, I was closeted most of my adult life, as were almost all LGBT people, because uh, society was still very hostile to us. But it's that same mentality that LGBT people do, harming no one in a bar are all a threat to American decency. It was outrageous, this sweeping, coloring, characterization of a group of people without any specific evidence. And it's, it's that same mentality. The thing is, we are the children of straight people. I love the young straight couples because they're going to be making the gay babies of tomorrow. <laughs> you know, in the case of uh, our internment, we look different. But in the case of LGBT people, we are literally members of the family. We are not the others. We are sons, daughters, brothers, sisters, cousins, maybe even parents. We are literally members of the family. And how some people can hold some dogma above the most natural thing, the love of a parent for their child and the child's love for their, pa <clears throat> for their parents. I mean, that's the madness of our society without really thinking and understanding. We are your children. We are your brother and sisters. And yet, they were put on paddy wagons and photographed as, as deviants and put on a list endangering all of the, the people, given that society. It's that kind of mentality that still exists to this day with Latinos coming across the southern border or Muslims coming into the country. Well, I hope we're going to have a lighter tone of uh, discussion. Yeah, actually, I'm going to end it on a very, very silly tone. Oh, good. What's your favorite sandwich? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to uh, say something that uh, um, that guy in the White House says. You know, there are good sandwiches on all sides of the bread. <laughs> I love tuna sandwich. I like turkey and cranberry. I like vegetarian. I like chicken salad. 
you know, there are things to, positive things to be said about all of them. <laughs> you like you like that too. No, you're the third uh, famous person who said that uh, turkey and cranberry is one of their favorite sandwiches. <laughs> one of many. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh... <laughs> we love you. <laughs> we love you. <laughs> He looks like a turkey and cranberry sandwich guy, doesn't he? <laughs> Don't eat too many of them. <laughs> Go ahead. Who was the biggest prankster on Star Trek? And what was the best prank you remember? Well, um, I must say Bill was, uh, but sometimes they were mean-spirited pranks. <laughs> and the one I remember is um, Leonard had a bike that, you know, the uh, studio is a long, I mean, a big place. And we moved from soundstage to soundstage, and uh, <clears throat> some of the crew people, but Leonard too, brought his bike and bi a bicycle around the the uh, studio lot, uh, not, not only from uh, studio to studio, but uh, to, uh, to lunch at the commissary or, or wherever. One day, that bicycle disappeared, nowhere to be found. And we all had our suspicions <laughs> as to who had played a, pr a prank on poor Leonard. Uh, Leonard c couldn't find his uh, 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 bicycle for days. And then suddenly it appeared. One of the crew people found it hanging from the rafters in the sound stage. <laughs> and we think we know who did it. <laughs> I've gotten the high sign. Thank you all very much. I love you all. Live long and prosper.